Thank you. Did you all hear that? I didn't have this on. You, you know you've been here before, right? Okay. First case, People versus Howard Kearse. Five, one, and five. Thank you. Calciano versus Poole. Seven and two, five and four. Stephanie B versus Joshua M. Submitted. Hennick Lane versus 616 First Avenue. Seven, two, and seven. Bianco versus Quality Gas Corp. Four minutes. Six, two, and four. Century Tower versus Fled Kamenetsky. I, I don't know who's supposed to go next because I don't know. You have to. Five and five and two, five, one and five. People versus Laron Jackson. Submitted. Rosenblum versus Rosenblum. I'm sorry. Repeat that, please. Seven and three, nine and one. Thank you. Eight hundred Third Avenue versus Roadrunner Capital. Six and two and five. Apotex Corp versus Hospira Health. I will grant the request, although we have hundreds, thousands of well-qualified New York lawyers, but we welcome you today. Give you uh, Nine and two and nine. Tesha Beva ver versus Family Home Care. Submitted. Jewish Press versus Kingsborough Community. Good afternoon. Six, two, and five. Patterson versus Beth Abraham is submitted. First case for argument is People versus Howard Kearse.
May it please the court, Abigail Everett for appellate Howard Kears. The weight of the evidence in this case does not support a finding that Mr. Kears caused physical injury. And we asked the court to reduce the conviction from robbery two to robbery three. Now, so, this, th this was a, a blow to the ear, to the side of the head. Yes. Um, and she reported that she had pain in her head, on the side, in her ear. She couldn't sleep on that side. Um, this went on for, I think, three days. Uh, why isn't that sufficient for physical injury? Well, in uh, evaluating the weight of the evidence, the court needs to look at the full record uh, in weighing and drawing inferences. So while, yes, she did give the testimony that Your Honor just referred to, also there was evidence that both she and her brother, the eyewitness, when they talked to the 911 operators, said that she was not hurt. The police officer who responded. Well, oftentimes adrenaline kicks in. People have been known to be shot by bullets and not realize that they've been shot uh, because of the adrenaline. So that doesn't, that she doesn't feel it right away. And I think she's on 911 with 911 right away. Why should that bear significant relevance here? Well, you also had the testimony of the police officer. He said he saw some swelling, but none of the officers saw anything that uh, prompted them to photograph. So you have no corroboration of the degree of the injury doesn't, she did. Counsel, counsel, doesn't that really just go to the weight? And those are issues that the jury uh, considered and heard and presumably found her to be credible with respect to her testimony, pain level seven, et cetera, et cetera, as my colleague has pointed out. Well, since we're asking the court to use its uh, authority under uh, weight of the evidence, this court does have, in fact, must weigh the evidence both for credibility and for the inferences to be drawn. And if you look at the second department decision in Wheeler that's cited in the brief, there the police officer who was punched in the lip at one point testified that his injury was, he said, quote, severe, at another point referred to it as a level three. So you can see But she that didn't say that. She's not equivocal in that way. She's, she's, they notice her face swollen. She, except for what she says seconds after she's hit, she's consistent. She says it's a level seven pain and et cetera. All of the other things I already said previously. Right, I think what I'm trying to suggest that these things are in flux and we don't know when she said it was a seven. She said in her testimony that that happened at the police station on the evening of the crime. It was at about one in the morning, but the police said she never went to the police station. So it's a little unclear at what point she thought her pain arose to level seven. We do know that her job started at noon the following day and she went to work. I see my light is on. I do want to touch briefly on the excessive sentence argument. This is a person who's doing 20 to life. The minimum is 16 to life. I would ask your honors again to use their interests of justice authority. This is a person who, uh, he's, you can see from the record at the resentencing, he has mental health problems. He, he's going to be at least 68, even if the court reduces it to the minimum of 16 to life, which is a substantial sentence. He, a person who was in special ed, he has uh, uh, diabetes, he has arthritis that causes severe pain in the knees. Uh, this is really somebody who I think the Department of Corrections and Parole should have the authority when he hits 68 to uh, assess whether it's appropriate to release him. I acknowledge that he has a long criminal record, but this is a person who, frankly, has struggled all of his life. There is, uh, docs determined that he needed uh, substance abuse treatment, and there is, it would be an appropriate assessment of the uh, equities in this case to modify the sentence to 16 to life and make him eligible for parole consideration at age 68. Unless there are any further questions? Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court, Carl Dubel for the people. Defendant's um, conviction for robbery in the second degree in this case was supported by more than sufficient evidence. This was an unquestionably violent attack where he grabbed the victim from behind, ripped her shirt. But that's not the aspect that goes to the physical injury. The physical injury, there has to be something that 
remains, lingers. So the, the fact that he grabbed her and all of that, while certainly, uh, you know, goes for his criminal proclivity, um, we're really talking about the blow to the ear. Yes, and exactly. her statements following that. Yeah, in you know during this attack, he did hit. He punched her in the ear, which the, the, the uh, victim described as a hard punch. Um, her pain. She what about what counsel says that she's um, you know she's up and down about what she says right after um, she reports to nine one one that she's fine. She feels no pain. Her brother says the same thing. No one's rushing her to the hospital. Well, I, I think your, your honor made my argument for me is that in that you know, immediately after the attack, she was likely in shock. You can hear the 911 recording on the phone. She is very frantic. And in that process, she's processing what happened to her. And she's also talking to the police, talking to the dispatcher. And then also she goes and searches the area to try to locate the defendant. Now, after all that settles down, she describes that her, pain, her ear was red and hot. She, the level of her pain was a seven. And this was not a, a fleeting injury. This lasted for three, three to five days. She had to take Tylenol and ice to relieve her pain. So why don't I ask you to move on to the other issue that counsel spoke about, the, um, the sentencing issue here, um, where the minimum is 16 years. Sure. We, we believe an above minimum sentence is appropriate in this case for a number of factors. First, given the violent nature of the attack, which I've kind of already touched on, um, with my other argument, but also given the defendant's significant criminal history, this is his fourth robbery conviction, and each time his sentences have gotten higher and higher, and he is still not deterred from his conduct. As part of his last sentence, well, he was- Your, your uh, adversary points out that he does suffer from uh, maybe issues, um, mental health issues. Um, he will be rather old when he gets out, no? Isn't that something that can be taken into consideration? Of course, that's something to consider, but I also think that's something that the trial court also likely considered as all of these arguments were in the pre-sentence report. And given the fact that defendant's last sentence was around, I believe it was 15 years to life, given that he was paroled from that sentence and then committed another crime with it, a very similar crime around a year after being paroled, we believe a, a higher sentence um, is more appropriate. Um, unless your honors have any questions about the other points um, in the briefs, I will ask, just ask that you affirm. Thank you. Thank you. Just briefly, I, I think that it would be appropriate to uh, allow him to be paroled at age 68. Uh, we could see at the resentencing, the three years that he had, was in Doc's custody between the original sentencing and resentencing, at this point he, he was doing very well. There were positive reports. And if you look at the nature of this crime, somebody who went to uh, a deli to ask them to give him a free beer, and then he goes to the local uh, ATM, and, and gets the $4 after robbing this woman to get a beer. This is a person who needs a lot of support in the community, and I would submit that it would be appropriate to allow him to be released at a more reasonable age under parole supervision, and maybe this time we could help him to, at this advanced age, to get control of his life at this point. And How I would far? Ask, Yes, yeah, sorry to cut you off. How far into his sentence is he at this point? He's actually quite a ways in because originally he was sentenced in 2018 and then he was resentenced in 2021. So I think, what, he's about seven years into it at this point? Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you both. Calciano versus Poole. Good afternoon, Your Honors, and may it please the court. Scott Danner and I represent the petitioner, Frank Calciano. There is no substantial evidence in this record that either of Mr. Calciano's children, JD the elder or DC the younger, was impaired. And because impairment is a necessary element of the finding of maltreatment below, this court should reverse and annul the decision after fair hearing 
upholding the report of maltreatment against my client. So as a preliminary matter, this is not a case that involves claims of physical impairment against the children. You don't have to have actual harm. You don't need phys physical harm for impairment that, um, that. and for maltreatment. So here we have that um, the mother, uh, along with DC and JD, reported that the parents argue often that um, and that this happened before the August incident, that uh, the abuse we have, we, we have the video or the audio listening to the whole thing play out, even the threats about calling in and um, reporting uh, alcoholism. Um, why, and, and that he would step on her like a roach. The children I know were upstairs, but that didn't preclude them from hearing. Uh, so why don't these facts uh, support a finding of substantial evidence. For yes, Your Honor, and I'll, I'll go through those facts. So Your Honor mentioned a series of arguments in the presence of the children. That is in the record, uh, we can see. However, the specific recordings that Your Honor described, including uh, you know, the contents thereof, those were not played in the record. That doesn't render them inadmissible, but there's no evidence from the ACS worker or anybody else that the children were present and heard the statements that were recorded. All we know from the record is that there were arguments among the parents that the children heard. That is not an adequate basis to find neglect. If it were, the state would be in too many households separating too many families, and the courts and the ALJ and the ACS would be put in a position of looking at who said what to whom and making inferences or judgments that a child exposed to this kind of talk but not that kind of talk must have been impaired. Remember, this is a statute about child well-being and child impairment. That's a necessary element. The evidence showed that these children were not impaired. It showed that they were thriving. They were doing well in school. They were well taken care of. They were well fed. They were well medically so it, treated. But isn't the question whether your client's conduct uh, put the children in an eminent risk of harm? And, and isn't there evidence in the record to suggest, based on what my colleague uh, has said, the fighting or the arguments over the years, the August 6th incident, wouldn't that be sufficient? Uh, wouldn't it be a fair and reasonable inference to draw uh, here? I, I don't think so, Your Honor. I, I think first I'd like to distinguish again the physical, uh, the risk of phys imminent physical impairment. Again, there was only a single incident of alleged domestic violence in this case, and the record was undisputed that the children were not in proximity or in the presence of the violence. So, we so did the children never testify that they had heard their parents argue often over the, the few years yes, prior the, to the incident? Yes, they're, they're, the children did state to ACS that um, they were uh, aware of arguing among their parents, but again. And one other question then, did, did um, DC, who is the ch his child, uh, report that he witnessed his parents fighting? Not that they were fighting, and his teachers reported that he seemed to be concerned at school about the behavior. I just want to make sure that I'm... Sure. On, on the record, I think D.C. did acknowledge that his parents fought, meaning yell at one another. Uh, by the time of the last interview, he said that had stopped. He used the past tense, and I think the report from both parents was that they were no longer fighting, including because the mother had moved out and the uh, custody proceedings had advanced. So in terms of imminent risk, again, in the absence of a finding of actual impairment. But, but then what about what, about, uh, what JC had to say? Uh, he was upset, um, the police was called, scared, did not know what the father was capable of. I mean, doesn't that suggest, in fact, that the, um, um, the trauma or the, what the parents were doing was affecting the children? JD did testify that he was scared. But again, in the absence of exposure to, uh, in, in the absence of evidence, So why would he be scared? Isn't that exposure to domestic violence? Isn't that what's really going on? Uh, he testified he was scared because he heard shouting. And, and we submit that hearing shouting and hearing arguments is not the same thing as witnessing physical So violence. if someone says, and I'm not saying it happened here, but if someone says, I'm going to kill you repeatedly, and someone hears that, the fact that they hear it and it doesn't happen doesn't cause trauma? I think a, a single incident of a 15-year-old child on the other side on another floor of the house overhearing one time a threat, I don't think that's sufficient but, to and make calling a finding the police, of substantial right? impairment. And calling the police? And calling the... Well, yeah. I, a 15-year-old calling the police on your parents is pretty dramatic. 
Yes, I think it's, it is clear, and we don't dispute that J.D. was scared in that moment, and that accounts for the call to the police. But you're suggesting that it was one incident. I don't know that one incident would suggest, would cause him to call the police. It's these repeated things that have happened that I've already commented on that have built up, and now finally, in this day in August or whenever it was, it happens again, and he calls the police on that day. I, I think the record shows a series of arguments among the parents, the number, the severity, and the content of which is not in the record. And I think that is inadequate. And I think pairing that with a single incidence of alleged violence, but unwitnessed violence in all accounts, is insufficient. Because remember, we're not judging Mr. Calciano's conduct in, in, as a parent in general. There are two elements. There needs to be negligent parenting, and there needs to be impairment. And in, in the case of emotional impairment, that's defined to be substantially diminished capacity and functioning. There is no record evidence that these children were suffering from substantially impaired functioning. Wasn't, so if, wasn't I may, if, if yes, I may, how do you address you know, the testimony regarding DC with respect to the behavioral uh, issues at, at school, you know, crying daily, refusing to eat, um, not completing homework for three weeks, and then there was the suggestion for him to uh, seek counseling, and uh, the petitioner rebuffed that suggestion. If, if I may, despite my red light going on. Yes, Your Honor, there, there, is in, there is evidence that DC was crying at school, but there was not evidence that that uh, upset at school was clearly attributable. And again, this is in the statute, that where we're dealing with emotional or mental impairment, it must be substantial and it must be clearly attributable to the parent's conduct. Didn't he Here. say, didn't he tell the teacher that it was um, the parents arguing? I, I don't believe so, Your Honor. I will check that uh, before I come back up for rebuttal. I believe what he said was that he did not have friends in his class. He was being bullied by a girl sitting next to him. And by the way, his parents were going through a divorce and custody battle. That's ten, that is an alternative likely explanation for a child who would be upset at school. And we're not asking you to reweigh that evidence. We're asking that the state maintain its burden to show that the negligent parent was clearly, or excuse me, that the upset was clearly attributable to the negligent parenting rather than one of these other many explanations. Thank you. Thank you. May it please the court, Cleland Welton for the state respondent. Uh, so, so counsel, uh, just addressing your, your adversary's last point, is there a causal connection between um, the upset the children were, were going through and um, uh, the, uh, the domestic violence? Uh, there, there certainly is a connection directly attributable with respect to JD. Um, he says he, that he called the police specifically because he heard the fight um, between um, <clears throat> Mr. Calciano and his wife, their mother, the children's mother, and the children's uh, grandfather, um, which escalated somehow from a fight over a cell phone bill into a three-way argument uh, that turned physical and involved death threats. Um, even if they weren't directly in the room, the record isn't totally clear on that, but even if they weren't directly in the room, they certainly overheard it. JD heard enough to know that he needed to call the police. And as so what said, about DC, who's I think eight at the time? Right, he was in the room but according to Calciano's testimony, he was in the room with JD, so whatever JD heard, uh, DC certainly also heard. Um, he expressed uh, in the record, I think page 239, that his life was bad because his parents were fighting all the time. This was after the incident. Um, he also uh, testified to ACS that um, JD got really scared um, when he heard these repeated incidents. Um, as, as you suggested, th this was not a, a one-time uh, dispute. This is something that builds up over time. There's indications in the record that there were multiple um, encounters with ACS, um, which eventually led to JD calling the police when the um, incident got bad enough that he overheard these death threats, overheard this physical violence. Sorry, Your Honor. Uh, it, it escalated to a point where um, he felt that he needed to call the police, and we submit that being that afraid for your own safety, for your mother's safety, for your grandfather's safety, um, is sufficient under this court's precedence to establish impairment, which is the only um, element of the, the claim that is at issue here. Um, I, I would point the, co the court generally to the cases we cite on footnote four of our brief, um, the Ashante case, the Hiley case, the Rosen, Rosengarten case, all uh, hold that fear, um, 
arising from domestic violence of this nature establishes impairment uh, for purposes of this statute. Although your adversary would suggest that, that um, the kids' feelings may come from just in general what the parents are going through, divorce proceedings, custody, and you know, all that stuff. Well, I, I think he can make that argument with respect to DC's conduct in school, but there's no way to make that argument with respect to JD calling the police. Um, and, or w even with respect to DC saying to ACS um, that his life was bad because his parents are fighting. He expressly says that at page 239 of the appendix. Um, and I, I think th that draws a clear link, uh, even if there's not something quite as clear with respect to uh, his crying at school, uh, there certainly is with respect to his more general feelings of upset and with respect to JD calling the police. Um, I see my light is on. If, if there's no further questions. You have two questions. minutes. That's what the white light indicates. Sure. Um, the only other thing I would say is I, I think that the, the balance of the factors clearly supports um, the ALJ's decision that uh, this conduct is relevant and related to um, child care issues. Uh, Mr. Calciano engaged in this repeated um, these repeated instances of uh, domestic violence, domestic abuse. Um, he did not afterwards even see, seem to think there was anything wrong. He had not done anything to uh, address this. Um, I think that you know, the ALJ clearly found that there, and had clearly had reason to find that there was a connection between that kind of behavior and his ability to serve uh, in a child care capacity going forward. Um, we think that all the ALJ's findings were well supported by substantial evidence, um, and we'd ask this court to confirm that determination and to dismiss the petition. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Josh Liebman for Respondent ACS. Uh, the father strangulating the grandfather and screaming that he would kill him all while both children were nearby in the home, close enough to overhear it, and as we discussed for the older child to call the police, certainly suffice to support the maltreatment finding here. Uh, ACS supports the state's position in all respects. I'd be happy to answer any questions the court may have. So even if it was the one time when they were fighting and it was due to the contentious nature because of their divorce, it would be sufficient? That's right, Your Honor, and this court has, has held in cases cited in our briefs, including the Carmine G case, even uh, the Angie G case cited by the father, that a single incident of domestic violence, if in close proximity to the children, uh, and if it causes uh, impairment, uh, suffices to support a maltreatment finding, and that's precisely what we have here. And what about the relation between uh, DC and this incident, or, or you know, whatever's going on between the parents? Um, was there enough of a direct link that it was what was going on with the parents versus being bullied at school? There certainly was, and indeed this court uh, should affirm the determination even without looking to, although the court certainly can look to DC's emotional uh, issues and other issues at school, uh, the record contains other evidence of emotional impairment adequate to support uh, the hearing officer's finding here. Uh, as my colleague noted, DC told ACS investigators that his life was bad because his parents were fighting all the time, uh, and by the father's own testimony, DC was with uh, Jay during the incident and would have heard just as clearly what Jay heard, which was uh, a violent incident involving strangulation and a screamed out death threat uh, in the home. So the and, link and there is incidentally, uh, was this, there were more incidents, correct? This is sort of a culmination of what was happening for a few years? That, that's right, Your Honor. Uh, the hearing officer was certainly right to recognize a pattern of abuse here, and I can briefly tick through just some of the pieces of evidence in the record reflecting that. Uh, this court can start with the police department's domestic incident report at the time, in which, which records the mother reporting that the father had threatened to kill her or the children, that he was violently and, and, and continually jealous of her, and indeed that that behavior had worsened in the months preceding the August uh, incident. Of course, the mother also showed audio and video to ACS investigators, and I know my colleague mentioned uh, that that evidence might be somehow an admissible, but of course in this administrative proceeding, the traditional rules of evidence don't apply. The hearing officer was well within his authority to consider that. Uh, both children uh, repeatedly expressed to ACS that the parents fought in front of them, and indeed even after the mother moved out of the home, ACS investigators spoke with uh, her new neighbor, who recounted that the father was driving past her new home and stalking her such that the neighbor was considering pursuing an order of protection against the father to get him to stop coming around. So looking at this constellation of evidence, there's plainly substantial evidence here to support what Your Honor pointed out, an additional pattern uh, of abuse that supports the additional finding that DC was at imminent physical risk by remaining in the home with the father. 
After um, J.D. and the mother moved out from petitioner's residence, wasn't he also again interviewed by ACS? And he expressed uh, that he did not feel comfortable around uh, the petitioner? That's correct. Uh, the older child, Jay, expressed multiple times to ACS over an extended period that he was afraid of the father. And I, I think the most salient quote is the one that we discussed a few, mo a few minutes ago. He said, I'm afraid of my father because I don't know what he's capable of. And this after uh, Jay called the police because he overheard his father choking and screaming that he would kill his grandfather in the home. So that's absolutely right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honors. Uh, both Respondents' Counsel uh, presented the record that uh, DC said life was bad, and citing A239 of the, of the record. That's not what he said. He actually said the opposite, and this has been turned upside down now repeatedly in the brief. So I'll flip to the page. CPS spoke with uh, DC and asked him how life is. DC said, eh. CPS, what does eh mean? DC said, life is eh, good, comma. Meh, meh means bad. So it's in the record, and he consistently uses this terminology with the CPS caseworker, that when he says eh, he means good, and when he says meh, it seems bad. It may seem a trivial point, except that we're talking about whether the children were impaired. We're not talking about whether petitioner engaged in conduct that falls below the standard of care. We do not contest that for purposes of this appeal. But the fact that, for example, the father may have driven around the house, there's no evidence that the child, children were aware of that or impaired of that. Now, maybe that goes to an imminent risk of harm, but we're talking about a single incident of domestic violence. There is no evidence in the record of any violence by petitioner against the mother, either oh, children. So there, weren't, so there weren't years or some, a few years of arguments culminating maybe in, in, in the August event, resulting in, in, in the son calling the police, sort of given the pattern of everything. Could, would that be a reasonable inference to make? I, I don't think so, Your Honor, because again, what the focus of the statute is, is on the effect on the children. And, what the, and hearing arguments alone, without evidence that the children are actually impaired as a result of the arguments, is insufficient. So why would JD call the police? I, I think he, in the he moment- didn't feel it's, scared. I apologize, I didn't mean to no interrupt, worries, Your Honor. No Why would he call the police if, if he didn't feel scared? I, I believe, the, I think that evidence supports the inference that he was afraid as a result of overhearing the argument on the separate floor. I nevertheless submit that is not sufficient to find impairment. A fleeting moment of being afraid is not sufficient. The statute requires substantially diminished functioning. It's a persistent state. Fleeting fear is not enough, and there are cases cited in our brief that stand for that proposition. Thank, Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you all. Hennick Lane versus 616 First Avenue. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court. My name is Jacob Lewin, I'm representing the appellant Hennick Lane. Hennick Lane submits this appeal of Judge Getz's decision that granted dismissal of Hennick Lane's third cause of action for delay damages that were caused by the defendants in this case. The cause of action was interposed. Why, why wasn't the court correct here when it uh, found that this modification, which I imagine is what you're going to talk about, right? the handwritten modification that's made here, um, that this provided JDS with um, the discretion to compensate HLI for delayed costs rather than um, the requirement to provide for delayed costs when in so many different sections it repeated no delay, damages for delay, no damages for delay, and suggested that, I think stated that those delays were compensated by the by the, the price, by the amount? Uh, I think the procedural uh, posture does affect that decision. Um, in this instance, the complaint set uh, a claim for the delay, for damages associated with delay, and in response to that claim, JDS interposed 
uh, what they presumed or represented as documentary evidence in the form of the contract. So the record that uh, Judge Getz had was a contract that was actually, the contract wasn't even interposed with anyone with personal knowledge. It was a, it was a contract that was abridged. It was the full version of the contract. And the contract itself, under CPLR 3211A1, has a requirement to utterly refute the claim. The fact that there's handwritten language in, the, in that agreement indicates under well-settled well, law. How do you, how do you, what, do you, what do you believe uh, is a reasonable interpretation of, of what that, uh, that uh, handwritten modification uh, means? That delay damages would be possible and discovery would be required in order to ter determine if costs or if any agreed upon costs were yielded from the parties. This is a pre-answer motion to dismiss. None of that was on the record before Judge Getz. And for this reason, we, I, we submit that the decision was erroneous in the sense that uh, the decision wrote, the modification provides JDS with discretion to compensate and plaintiff for delay costs. But nowhere in the record did JDS actually represent that there was never uh, discretion implemented or anything related to delay costs. This is a poll. That's what we want discovery to, to demonstrate and to prove. And at this stage, we've been foreclosed from that ability to proceed under that claim. If, I mean, you you ask for time, you have no, a little I, bit more. I, you don't so, have to go no, on no, if you I, don't I, want. I, I just want to raise one more point with respect okay. to uh, 3211A7 that the agreement that the, sorry, the complaint did represent that delay claims uh, in an adequate form, uh, in, in so far doing, we've actually stated a claim that met that, that requirement, and that issue was actually not addressed by the judge, but it was addressed under the appeal. Just wanted to raise that issue as well. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Daniel Dorfman on behalf of Respondent. May it please the court. Your Honor, so, so counsel, uh, why don't you address the same question? In your view, uh, what is the, um, uh, the handwritten language and compensated for additional mutually agreed to costs? What does that mean? Uh, that's exactly where I was going to go, Your Honor. Um, that means that it's JDS's discretion if there was going to be compensation for the delay. But as um, you all have pointed out already, there's eight different provisions in the contract where it says there are no damages for delay. Well, there's, so arguably there's an inconsistency between the various provisions. And, and uh, why Absolutely. shouldn't there be discovery uh, uh, to sort of... To, to flesh out the claim, in fact, that there was a discretionary determined, uh, that in its discretion, your client could, in fact, compensate. Yeah, absolutely. I understand what you're asking. There is no ambiguity here, because it doesn't say that Hennick Lane would be entitled to, damage, to delay damages. What it says is, in the sole discretion of JDS, they have the ability to well, compensate. Well, what it actually I says. Um, is in the discretion of JDS, uh, that's in brackets, yeah. and compensated for additional mutually agreed to costs. That's not even proper English. I mean, to really, it, it, in the discretion of JDS and compensated for additional mutually agreed to costs. I mean, so th there's no ambiguity there, even as it reads? There, there's not, Your Honor, and I understand why, you, as you said, you would say that or see that, um, and, and here Frankly, is if that clause were in front of the word in, it might make a little bit more sense. Uh, work shall be extended for a period equivalent to the time actually lost and compensated for additional mutually agreed to costs in the discretion of JDS, but that's not what it says. If Hennick Lane pled anything to identify that respondent had made any sort of statement, um, had any sort of obligation to pay for um, uh, delay damages, then I would say there's ambiguity but, here. But isn't that what we um, traditionally have discovery for? Uh, but 
I, I, that's not what's here, though. What we have on our record and what's pled in the third count for Hennick Lane is um, they're seeking delay damages for a project for which there was no agreement between the parties to pay them for delay damages. So they're trying to use this language. Wouldn't, the, wouldn't, but wouldn't you have a better argument if that language wasn't in there? I'm sorry, Your Honor. Continue. I think you would have a better argument if that if that additional language wasn't in there. But but that does sort of complicate uh, the analysis, no? Uh, I don't see how it complicates the analysis because it doesn't say that JDS is required or that the parties would pay for additional delay damages. What it says, and uh, and it says it inartfully. I think you're right. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's ambiguous, that in discretion of the construction manager and, um, and compensated for additional mutually agreed upon costs. But there are 30 other provisions in the contract where it makes clear. You're absolutely right about the 30 other provisions. That's why I mentioned that when I asked the initial question. But it still just hangs out there and compensated for. And it was uh, you know, handwritten in um, to suggest that it was different than the other, what all of the other statements. So it's it's sort of like, oh, by the way, don't forget that you said you're going to compensate us. I mean, it just is there. Yeah, it but seems it that at this pre-answer stage, that it would um, th that when you look at this and find an ambiguity, um, I mean, it seems like that's the way it should be read here. Your Honor, the the agreement doesn't say as we just looked at and talked about it, that J JDS will compensate. Right? No, it doesn't. And I think, that make, I think that's a very important point, right? Because it says in the discretion, JDS may upon mutually agree upon, right? Um, and, and there is no anywhere in, in, in the complaint. But, at, but it's, your, it's your motion to dismiss, as your, your colleague points out, 3211A1, documentary evidence based on the contract. You, you have to utterly refute plaintiff's claims here. And I think what we're suggesting is that this language uh, doesn't necessarily utterly refute their claims. Yeah. Um, Your Honors, I, I understand the point that you are making. And, and um, I, I will sit on our briefs and say that um, the, the, the in order for there to be an ambiguity, there needs to be uh, two different ideas here, and based on the language uh, and the insertion of that the construction manager may, in its sole discretion... Well, compensate. first of all, it doesn't say sole discretion. I, th I think we've read it to you. It says discretion. Discretion of... In the discretion of the construction manager and compensated for additional mutually agreed... And compensated. And, and the and. Doesn't the and, and change it? Yes. Yes. That's all I have. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Unless your honors have any additional questions, I'm prepared to close. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you both. Thank you very much. Blanco versus Quality Gas Corp. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Bridget Schultz for the appellant. Of course, as this court knows, that in order to impose liability upon a defendant for an alleged defective condition, the defendant has to have either created the condition, have actual or constructive notice of the condition, um, none of which uh, happened here. Um, well, well first with constructive notice, how did you establish a prima facie on constructive notice? I heard, how did, how did you, you establish a prima facie on the constructive notice aspect? So in this instance, we are relying upon three key witnesses, um, two of which are employed by Cumberland Farms and one of which is the respondent herself. Cumberland Farms set forth an affidavit and deposition testimony of two of its employees, one of which was the senior project construction manager who was overseeing a, a construction project that was occurring at the premises but was unrelated to the sidewalk. So in the spring of 2015, Cumberland Farms was removing underground storage tanks and once a week, an employee of Cumberland Farms, a project manager, 
would go to the scene and would conduct weekly inspections, and the business practice was to report any conditions unrelated to the construction itself to Cumberland Farms to the extent that there were any needs for repairs. Me, or in, in, in support of this motion, I believe you submitted an affidavit from Scholes. Is that right, Scholes? It was his deposition. Sorry, Scholes and, and Figueroa were the depositions. But you're talking about you know this this site and everything else um, where we're speaking about the difference uh, in the measurement of this area where she tripped. And the, the people who you put forth, um, the witnesses who you put forth, never visited this site. Is that right? That, that's correct, Your Honor. Um, bo both witnesses, however, were... And the plaintiff had an expert who went to the site and measured it, and measured it to be a greater distance, I think almost two inches, than what the other experts or witnesses testified to. Sure, Your Honor. I, I would like to, to um, address a few different things. So um, one being the, the witnesses that were set forth by Cumberland Farms in support of our motion, and also the affidavit that was set forth by the plaintiff's expert. But for, first, the, the defendant's witnesses. Yes, you are correct. Neither have it, had visited the site. Um, I, I would you know, point out that the site was actually vacant at the time of plaintiff's accident. It was a, they previously had a tenant at the gas station. That tenant moved. I understand, but then there's litigation. They could have gone out and viewed the site. They didn't. Sure. After after the litigation, they could they could have gone to the site. Um, Cumberland Farms did have an investigator that did go to the site a week after plaintiff's deposition to also conduct measurements. Um, but of course, yeah, sure, they, they could have gone to the site. But in terms of notice, um, it, it would be it would be kind of meritless if they had gone to the site and testified. You're right with after, regard to after notice the, after the litigation set forth. But I would point out that both witnesses were able to set forth what the standard business practices were of Cumberland Farms in terms of what someone would have to be uh, what or what would be reported and where any reports of any repairs oh, or any items that would need oh, to be repairs or defects would be kept. In the record, in the record, is there any showing of when the sidewalk was last inspected? Would before the accident or well, before the accident? Because we're talking about notice, right? That's what. You, that's. The, so what I can't answer definitively is. Well, then how do you make I, out a prima facie if you can't even answer that question? No, what, what I can say definitively was um, Mr. Scholes, or sorry, um, the, the Cumberland Farms claims manager, or sorry, no, I am right. James Scholes did testify that there were weekly inspections of the project site before the accident. What the last date of that inspection was, I can't say for sure. Who certain. did the inspections? Were records made of the inspections? I mean, we've, a lot of, often uh, businesses have those kinds of records when they make those inspections, correct? The, the issue though is that there simply weren't any records that were submitted of any defective or any items that needed repair, so there would really be nothing to set forth before the court if nothing was created in the first place. But Your Honor, what I did want to touch on was the affidavit that you mentioned that the defendant's expert submitted. First of all, it was submitted two months after our motion for summary judgment was submitted. There were absolutely no photos attached to that affidavit. There were absolutely no um, pictures of measurements that were submitted in connection with that affidavit. Actually, I'm saying affidavit. But he, this is a sworn, yes, go ahead. You were yeah, going sure. to Sure, it, it wasn't submitted in the form of an affidavit. And of course, um, Mr. Fine, who was the defendant's expert, did not actually articulate where his inspection took, took place in the first place. And I would also be remiss if I did not point out on the issue of notice that the plaintiff, who lived in the general vicinity of this area and who had a friend on 92nd Street where her accident took place, had walked on the sidewalk four times before the accident. She testified that she had never noticed any problems with the sidewalk. She had never tripped. She had never fallen. One of her friends was actually with her on the date of her accident, was walking right in front of her, and her friend had no issues with the sidewalk. And the plaintiff at her deposition also testified that her son did not report any issues with the sidewalk. And so in terms of notice, Yes, the defendants did set forth two witnesses who had not been to the scene, but were able to testify about the business records that Cumberland Farms maintains. But I would submit that the best witness in this case, in terms of notice, is someone who had actually been to that site before, four times before her accident, and never noticed any problems. Thank you.
May it please the court, David Craven, Sacco and Felis for the respondent. Uh, on the issue of constructive notice, as your honor correctly pointed out, there is no records whatsoever in the, um, in how, the about, how about notice from the plaintiff? I'm sorry? Could, could um, the defendants establish uh, lack of notice through your client's uh, testimony? I don't believe so, because when she was asked if uh, she noticed any defects before, she said that she was not paying attention to it. And plus, on the day of the accident, she was carrying a box of donuts, which would have limited her vision as far as um, being able to see the defect. Uh, she estimated that she had been on that sidewalk four times. She could not recall the last time she had been on that sidewalk. Uh, so I don't believe that there's really anything to support uh, the fact that there was any lack of constructive notice. Was there any testimony that one of the, um, one of the individuals from the defendant uh, had measured the sidewalk to be a little over a half an inch or something? From the defendant, he did testify that there was, I'm sorry, he did, uh, the defendant's investigator did say that there was a crack, or I'm sorry, a depression of one half of an inch. Um, but as I was like to point out on the record, page 234, you can clearly see on the left side of the photograph that it goes well beyond, beyond an inch. In fact, he said that it was completely level. And your own eyes, Judge Hackler's eyes, could even see that. That is looking at the measuring. Is there? There's a um, a ruler or something. There's a ruler sticking out of the middle of the sidewalk. And there's a part of it that looks like it goes up beyond the half inch of the ruler. Is that, that is correct. correct? You have anything else? Uh, I do not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to um, briefly point out, because there was an insinuation that a box of donuts was somehow impairing the plaintiff's ability to see the sidewalk in front of her, there is, that's just implied. There's nothing um, of substance to support that in the record. She was just simply asked what she was carrying, and she said a box of donuts, but she did confirm that she was looking ahead of her at the time of her accident. In terms of the photograph, well, that doesn't that all go to comparative negligence? Sorry, everything you're raising now doesn't that just go to her comparative negligence? I, I, I mean, I would submit She's that been over that it four she, times. She was carrying a box of donuts. She didn't see where she was going. wasn't looking, et cetera, et cetera. Isn't that all you're arguing just now? Sure, that that would go to comparative negligence. And of course, I'm not here to talk about comparative negligence or even argue. Or I'm solely focused, not solely on the appeal, but for purposes of oral argument, solely referring to notice. I just didn't want there to be any type of insinuations that she some her view was somehow obstructed at the time of her fall. So what just, about the ruler? What about this measuring device? and the fact that when one looks at it, it looks like it goes up above the half inch, even though uh, the witness only referred to the half inch area. Your Honor, I'm honestly trying to wrap my head around where counsel's coming from. I've stared at this photograph um, a, a host of times since I have uh, handled the, the, the motion practice on this case, and I can't seem to find what counsel is referring to um, or what he is looking at. Um, of course, we submit, as our, as our um, investigator also submitted and attested to in his affidavit, that the sidewalk is of consistent height between the two slabs. Um, and if anything, there was a depression of about approximately one half inch in some of the spaces in between the two slabs. And Now, I, I say this um, not to be confused, Fusing because the plaintiff did not testify that it was the depression that caused her fall. She was she was she testified that there was a height differential in the sidewalk that caused her fall. Didn't didn't Mr. Fine say there was a two to three inch elevation difference? He did, but again, Your well, Honor, doesn't isn't that sufficient to raise an issue of fact between your investigator and uh, Mr. Fine, the notorious Mr. Fine? No, Your Honor, because Mr. Fine did not in any way, shape, or form articulate where he actually conducted his measurement in his affidavit. It's completely devoid of any reference to the actual scene of the accident in his affidavit, and he also doesn't submit any photographs or proof of measurements to support that testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Century Tower versus Fled and Kaminsky.
Good afternoon, Your Honors. My, uh, may it please the court. My name is Scott Winnico from the firm Donovan Hatem LLP, and I represent Feld Kamenitsky and Cohen, a division of GEI. And I'm going to refer to Feld Kamenitsky as GEI, um, as I do in the brief. The evidence submitted to the court below established that plaintiff's claim against GEI is time barred by the statute of limitations and that the co-defendant's claims for contribution, common law indemnification, contractual indemnification must be dismissed because they fail as a matter of law. So this, this is a pre-answer motion. It was a pre-answer motion right? to dismiss, yes. Um, on the statute of limitations ground, uh, your motion was denied because the court found that you didn't conclusively establish when the action accrued. Is there any question as to that? There, there, there is no question as to when the cause of action accrued. The cause of action accrued under the under State versus, versus London, a, 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 a progeny of cases, when the professional relationship ended, uh, when, the, when the non-ministerial acts have ended, even if there are lingering acts, incidental acts. That and you occurred, argue that that was in December that, 2015? That at the latest, in, by December 2015, I would argue November 15, when the New York City Department of Buildings issued its um, letter of completion. But by December 2015, that's the last time we performed services. We issued our what? final invoice in February of 2016. When did you get paid, by the way? What? When did you get paid? Uh, I don't know when we got paid, but when we got paid is immaterial. Okay, but, so then what do, we, what do we make of the affidavits um, in opposition, essentially saying that your client was involved in the uh, uh, remediation? remediation? There, there is no evidence to support that that's all. This is a pre-answer. My colleague asked you, it's a pre-answer motion. It's not summary judgment. It's pre-answer. So we have something in opposition saying that you folks were on the scene. From right. Stefano and the, Norton. The, the person in that says it has no personal knowledge. He says he believes that someone was there. And in fact, the person that he identified from GEI as being the person involved in the remediation had already left GEI's employment at the time. He doesn't place anyone from GEI. So why shouldn't there be discovery uh, so there can be a determination, for example, whether or not there is a tolling of statute of limitations based on continuous representation, issues with respect to when, in fact, you left the job site? Because the evidence, the documentary evidence, establishes that we stopped work by December 2015. There's a three-year statute of limitations. The action was not commenced until July 2021. We, there is no evidence whatsoever. There are emails. There's no evidence that we were asked to come. Uh, there is no evidence that we were... It, so you, worst, you're saying case, that... I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt, but you, you know, essentially what you're saying is we have to ignore, or we should be ignoring these affidavits because the people didn't go to the site. But it, one of them is the senior branch director for uh, New York um, from Structural, I guess. That's the... Norton. Mr. Norton, correct. Mr. Norton, right. And so Mr. Norton says, well, it's sometime between um, July 2017 and May 2019. Then there's uh, your um, witness, Mr. Stavaros, and he says it's between July 2017 and May 2019. Um, he says that those dates were incorrect, rather. So... You know, he says it's somewhere between 2017 and 2018. But well, those... Mr. Stervo says that he, he didn't get called back to the site for this particular issue until January 2019. We did some, we, we were contacted before and did about other work, but not related to the balcony issue. And for there to be continuous treatment, it has to relate to the issue at hand. And whether or not we were well, So you say, you say you're out. Their affidavits say that, that in fact, you're involved in the remediation. I, so the question is, is... is does the documentary evidence utterly refute plaintiff's claims? Ab absolutely. And also... Counsel, no, how notice. can that be? How can that be? Because GEI was also the architect. Am I correct about uh, that? No, we, we were only the engineer. And that's where the lower court you know, okay. made, made a mistake uh -huh. because it tries to rely upon, it relies upon the century structural agreement. We're not a party to that. Well, I want to follow up because I was under the impression that the um, AIA standard form listed GI as the architect and part of the duties with that was to issue a certificate of uh, final payment. But as you indicated before, uh, in response to my colleague, you don't know when the final payment was made. So if we don't know that, 
how do we know when the claim accrued? Well, under State versus London, the Court of Appeals case, the certificate is meaningless. It does not make a difference in terms of accrual. The claim accrues when the project is complete and non-ministerial work is done. With regards to that struck that agreement between Century and Structural, we're not a party to that agreement. Nothing in our contract, nothing in our purchase order obligated us to issue a certificate of payment. They're trying to impose an obligation on us that we never agreed to perform. And there's nothing in the record that shows hey, we agreed to perform those services that are set forth in the structural century agreement. We're not a party, we're not a signatory. That agreement was entered into a year afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court, Megan Hill of Prior Cashman for Respondent Century Tower Associates. The motion court here correctly denied appellant's motion to dismiss in its entirety because first, Century sufficiently alleged both a breach of contract claim and a negligence claim against GEI within the statute of limitations. And second, GEI did not meet its burden to produce documentary evidence that utterly refuted Century's allegations, including as to the applicability of any statute of limitations. In the first instance, GEI didn't establish that Century's allegations were insufficient to state a claim for breach of contract. And second, GEI didn't satisfy- I think really the issue is statute of limitations. I'm sorry? Would you address the statute of limitations? That's really the issue here, statute of limitations. So the court below didn't reach the issue of whether the three-year or the six-year statute of limitations applied. The court uh, accepted for the point of, accepted GEI's argument for the purposes of this motion that uh, the, to the extent that the allegations were for architectural malpractice, that there would be a three-year statute of limitation. And the court found that, the, that GEI had not utterly refuted with its documentary evidence when the, first, as to the accrual of the statute of limitations, and second, they had not established uh, that there was not a continuous just, representation. Just as, a, as a side note, on a, on a 3211A1 motion, uh, should we even consider an affidavit uh, saying we left the job site on, on X date and that there's no evidence that we were back after that? No, Your Honor, and in fact, there's case law, and I don't have it right at hand, but there is case law stating that affidavits of uh, individuals are not uh, proper documentary evidence on a motion to dismiss, um, nor did, and if anything, the, the lower court noted that the that the, excuse me, that the affidavit that was submitted by GEI as well as the attachments to that affidavit um, actually created additional issues of fact as to the accrual of the statute of limitations that GEI sought to uh, impose on Century's claims. Do you have any other questions? I just briefly wanted to address something that um, appellant raised, which was that um, my apologies, I already addressed it. So unless you have any other questions, that's Thank all. you. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court. Brian Morgan from Fager, Drinker, Biddle, and Reith on behalf of the defendant respondent, Digger Specialties. Uh, I'm before the court on the very limited issue of the availability of the cross claims for contribution and I uh, just wanted to note that saying that the plaintiff is only seeking uh, the recovery of economic loss as GEI does in its briefs does not make it so. As your honors have noted, this is a pre-answer motion to dismiss. We don't have a bill of particulars. We don't have discovery responses. So all we have is the complaint. And if you, and the complaint clearly states that the plaintiff is seeking to recover for damages caused by the defendant's negligent performance as well as or in addition to remediation costs. What damages were caused by the defendant's alleged negligence? Well, if you flip to that count, which is uh, count five on pages 31 and 32 of the record, you'll see that the plaintiff alleges that the balconies are falling apart, which this court has held constitutes injury to property within the meaning of CPLR 1401. Um, those cases are cited in my brief, but it's the tower building and the castle village case. Um, you'll also see allegations that the balconies are unsafe and unfit for use. In Lake Placid, a third department case on which GE relies, the court has held that allegations of that nature go beyond mere economic loss. 
So plaintiffs asserting a tort claim for which it's seeking traditional tort remedies in addition to the contract's claims. The Supreme Court was correct to uh, deny the motion to dismiss as it pertains to the, uh, the cross claims. Um, if your, honor has, your honors have any questions, I'd be happy to address them at this time. Otherwise, I'll sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court. My name is Guy Rosier. I'm representing uh, Respondent Structural uh, on this appeal. I just want to raise two quick points before I sit down. Uh, the first one is when did the plaintiff's claim accrue? And I think the rule in this particular instance is very simple. The cause of action accrues upon completion of construction. Now, that's not a term that's defined in any statute, so we have to look at it within the context of the relationship between the parties. Now here we have two contracts. We have the purchase order between GEI and the plaintiff, and we also have the AIA standard form contract between our client, Structural, and the plaintiff. Now GEI contends that there's no connection whatsoever between these two contracts, but that's actually refuted or belied by the documentary evidence, uh, limited though it may be on this pre-answer motion, that we have in the record. Now let me just give three very quick references. The first one is on page 136 of the record. Now this is part of the instructions to the bidders, uh, which were prepared by GEI. That's, that's apparent on page 99 of the record because their name is all over these documents. Uh, and this was done by GEI as part of their scope of work under the purchase order. They were supposed to prepare the bid documents. Now these instructions say that GEI shall act within the scope of the particular powers and duties vested in the engineer and in the was architect. There, there's no privity there, is there? Sorry? Is there privity? Uh, there's no privity, but... Uh, then how are they bound by it? Well, they're bound by it to the extent that the court may find that it's, and this is how it normally works in the, in the AIA suite of contracts, there are two separate contracts. If the contract between, uh, let's say, GEI and the owner uh, references or contemplates that uh, within that relationship, GEI has agreed to act as the architect, it doesn't matter that they're not a party to the AIA standard form contract between the owner and the contractor because the, the uh, well, Is that something you hope to, to, to find in discovery, or, or are you just relying on the purchase order? I mean, what, what? Well, the purchase order, I think, contains certainly clues. It's certainly not inconsistent with the fact that they agreed to act as the architect. And the best proof of that, I would say, is on page 96 of the record. As part of the closeout phase, GEI, and this is part of the purchase order itself, says that GEI will issue a certificate of substantial completion. Uh, and if you look at section 15.4.3 of the AIA standard form contract, that also says when the architect determines that the work or designated portion thereof is substantially complete, the architect will issue a certificate of substantial completion. I would submit that that's not a coincidence, or it's likely not a coincidence. These were architects, they knew what these standard form contracts mean. So even though there's no explicit reference in the purchase order to GEI agreeing to uh, act as the architect under the standard form contract, there are enough, more than enough indicias to suggest that there ought to be discovery on this issue to find out um, whether in fact there is, uh, it is part of that relationship. Now if I may just briefly touch on the second point that I wanted to bring up, the continuous uh, representation doctrine. Uh, the issue here is even assuming that GEI established when the cause of action accrued, there's still a further issue of fact here as to whether anything happened uh, after the completion of construction, assuming- Whether there was any rem remediation. Right, if anything occurred with respect to remediation. And here we have a classic issue of fact between whatever uh, Mr. Stavaro said in support of the, of the, the motion, the pre-answer motion to dismiss, and what our witness, Mr. Naughton, said in his affidavit contradicting that. And uh, essentially, there's additional evidence in a letter from um, Plaintiff's Counsel dated February 27, 2019, which is on, um, I don't have the exact record side. Uh, but essentially uh, corroborating what Mr. Naughton said that essentially two years ago, and this is February 2019, each of you, this was addressed among others to Mr. Stavaros, were made aware of what appeared to be first signs of failure in the system. So whether or not, and the degree of involvement here uh, of uh, GEI in remediation efforts that occurred timely within the statute of limitations, assuming that we know when it began to, to accrue, 
um, we should have some discovery on this issue to find out whether the continuous representation doctrine applies. So unless the court has any further questions, I'll uh, rest on my brief for the rest of the arguments. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Your Honors, uh, with regards to the letter he's referring to, it's, it's at record page uh, 192. And I was about to refer to that letter because in that letter, Mr. Kramer, the former counsel for Century, says nothing was done by you at that time to identify the cause of the deterioration or remedy the conditions. In order for the continuous treatment doctrine to apply, you can't just have notice. So even, even if you were to say, well, there's an issue of fact as to whether or not we had notice, notice by itself does not toll the statute of limitations. Yeah, but, but again, that's again, the 850. Counsel, counsel. It's, the motion, it's the motion to dismiss on documentary evidence. And, and, and I feel like we're arguing a summary judgment motion here. There are affidavits here that say that your client were there involved in remediation, and we would have to reject those affidavits, which, which I, I would submit to you is not appropriate. Well, the, the affidavit from Mr. Norton says he believes. He doesn't know. He said he was told by someone. It's all hearsay evidence that this court can disregard. But even if we were there, again, that's only notice. Nothing was done by Mr. Kramer's own admission at R 192, nothing was done. Therefore, without nothing being done, there can be no continuous representation. The continuous treatment doctrine is simply inapplicable. It just doesn't apply. Notice by itself is not. Also, with regards to this issue about uh, GI somehow being obligated to perform services under the century structural, we're not, we're not under that contract. We're not a party to that contract. That contract is not incorporated in. The situations where you have AIA contracts and an AI and you, you have an incorporation by reference as a reference to terms and conditions. Our contract is silent on that. In terms of a certificate of substantial completion, the New York City Department of Buildings issued a letter of completion saying everything is done. We sign off on this on November 15th, 2000, uh, 2014. It was done. It was complete. There's nothing more that needs to be done. There is, the Century has documentation, or should have documentation, to show that they notified us, that they brought us back. None of that is before the court because it does not exist. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you all. Rosenblum versus Rosenblum. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Richard Dolan for the appellant cross-respondent Kenneth Rosenblum. Uh, this case involves a real estate business uh, between a mother and a son uh, owning a bunch of properties in Greenwich Village. Since um, 2015, Kenneth has been trying to extricate himself from what he saw as effectively a partnership between him and his mother's advisors, principally struck. His mother was 101 at the time of the trial that the trial court found that she was basically incompetent to testify. That was hardly an irrational view on Kenneth's part. Uh, his we, we understand this is a long, you know, it's been, I don't want to say drawn out, but it's gone on for several, several years. We understand. Um, I want to move to the settlement agreement. Sure. Um, and, um, and the withdrawal date of your client. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're... Your client says that his withdrawal date was um, December 12th, 2016. That's but there, correct. Yeah. But there's a lot of evidence in here, a lot of testimony that establishes that he continued to be actively involved in managing the LLC uh, and the properties until about 2019. Uh, the, the short... The short answer, judges, it's all irrelevant. The valuation and withdrawal date is governed entirely by statute. Section 606 of the LLC law says 
that you have an absolute right to withdraw, and you do it by two things. One, you send a written notice of withdrawal, and six months later, it's effective. So, so in other words, um, as my colleague was bringing out, if your client is, is actively engaged, I understand they're management companies, in the business, we don't look at the facts, we just make a, a decision based on your election. You look at the statute, first and foremost, Judge. If the statute is clear, the court's obligation is to apply it as written. So what does withdrawal mean to you? Withdrawal, it, it is a technical term in the LLCL. It says you withdraw, section 7. Withdrawing from the LLCs, correct? You withdraw as a member. Then it has two other provisions that are relevant. Section 701 tells you what's supposed to happen in that six-month period. The non-withdrawing member has an election. She can, either, uh, she can either treat the withdrawal essentially as a dissolution, and then you look to the dissolution provisions of the statute, or she can elect to continue the business, in which event section 509 tells you what happens for the withdrawing member. That says that the withdrawing member is entitled to be paid his fair value as of the withdrawal date with, with reasonable promptness. That's the statutory scheme. So in other words, if your client were to continue uh, managing the building for, for several years, uh, that fact cannot be taken into consideration. The statute makes it irrelevant. And, the, and secondly, Judge, it, what you're missing here is that he, when he withdrew and gave written notice, and what happened is she's supposed to make an election. She did. She elected to continue. Then she's supposed to pay him. We're here six and a half years later, and he has never been paid a dime. So what is he supposed to do when the statute sets up an either or? Either you, you, you elect to dissolve because he's withdrawn, or you continue and pay him. And she does neither one. And he's got, the trial judge got this right before trial. What she said is the statutory date of December 2016 was the actual date. And the parties went to trial on that basis. We both submitted expert reports as of that date. Why? Because that's what the trial court told us to do. It follows directly from the statute. The valuations that were submitted, they submitted one saying his value was about 22 million, ours was closer to 30 million and change. That's a lot of money. He's, it's been tied up in a business which is entirely hers for six and a half years, and what does he have to show for it? And the answer is nothing. They tell you, their appeal says he gets no interest on his 25, 26 million in capital that they've been using. He's not entitled to distributions. He's supposed to sit there and shut up until they feel good and ready to pay him. That's not what the statute says. And it's all we're asking you on this aspect of the appeal is to apply the statute as written. All of the things the judge was referring to, the equities, the blah, 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 that applies only in a, when you're seeking dissolution, because there is no absolute right to dissolve an LLCL. It turns on all the factors. Because it turns on those factors, the statute does not provide a date at which a dissolution is effective. Withdrawal, it does. And where the statute is clear and direct, as this one is, all you do is enforce it. Uh, uh, happily, the record is complete on all of that, because the trial judge told us how to value that. The trial judge, in her post-trial decision, basically confused a dissolution with withdrawal. She cites a, a dissolution case, which is different. She cites a bunch of other things, all of which relate only to dissolution, not withdrawal. That was the basic mistake. This all was tried in 2000, just before COVID. Here we are three years later. It can be decided on the record. All you have to do is send it back to the trial judge and say, that was the correct date. You got it right the first time. Just decide it based on that evidence. I want to discuss very briefly, unless you have any questions about that, uh, the cross appeal, which has to do with the, the uh, interest issue. Uh, and that's what they, what they are asking the court to do, essentially, is to disregard uh, what you said in your 2018 decision. And I know Judge Singh was the only one on that panel. And I remember, Judge, you were questioning me on that case uh, when it was argued. The bottom line is what you said is that they're entitled to use of the money damages if it was material, and you left that, you left that all open. You also didn't discuss uh, any resolution as a matter of law of the causation issue. What the trial court did here is simply follow your mandate. She said, 
you said they get used to the money damages. She said, what money were they deprived the use of? She said, the money that Ken used on various transactions. The first transaction that they point to is a mortgage he took in November of 2013. Remember, the settlement is October of 2013. He's supposed to pay 14 million. He takes a mortgage on his separately owned property, it generates three million in change, and every penny of that money was used to pay down the settlement. You're they, saying that would be absurd? I, because I, he's refinancing specifically to pay back the money? It strikes me as pretty crazy, but it's up to your honors to, to decide whether, whether I'm right or not. Uh, I don't, I don't it's, it, quite apart from whether it's even that, what is the damage that's caused by the breach if he uses every penny to pay them? What money are they being deprived the use of? And the answer is nothing. On, on all the other transactions that are relevant here, what the trial judge said was, I'll look to how much money Ken used on those transactions. They get interest on that amount of money. That's not what they're talking about in their brief, because everything else in those transactions was funded by a purchase money mortgage. It was basically the seller funding the, the purchases. They got exactly what this court said they were entitled to. Uh, I'll reserve the rest for my rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you. May it please the court, <clears throat> Michelle Palmer, Strook and Strook and Levan. For Counsel, I'm going to throw you off a bit by asking you to pick up where we left off and then kind of backtrack, just with regard to that refinance issue. So he refinances on a property, I'm over here, he refinances on a property specifically to honor, satisfy the statute, the, um, the, the stipulation, the agreement. Sure, so let's, let's even... Let's give him that transaction. He then engages in a series of other transactions in which he acquires $40 million in buildings before he's repaid $8 million that he owed under the settlement agreement. So that transaction in November was followed in December by a closing on a purchase that he, he, he didn't use funds from that to repay, uh, to, replay, to repay Bernice. The settlement agreement is very clear in, it says, Ken agrees he will fully repay said sum, meaning the $14 million, he will fully repay said sum prior to entering into or funding in any way any other business transaction. There's no dispute here that he did enter into and fund other transactions, and there's no dispute that $8 million and change remained owed under the settlement agreement. So what appellant would like to do is rewrite the contract to say that if he puts any money towards any other transactions, he has to pay the same amount down on the settlement agreement. And the parties could have agreed to that agreement, but they didn't. They entered into agreement in which prior to that transaction, he had to pay $8 million. And that is what Bernice's expectation damages were, that on the day he enters into the first transaction, that breaches the contract, she would have $8 million. That's the use of the money to which she was deprived, and that's the money that interest should accrue on. And, and by the way, this theory now as to the damages are based on the amount that he puts towards other transactions is a new theory, because um, on summary judgment, counsel conceded that the methodology that you would use is this methodology resulting in two and a half million dollars. They said they're left with the claim that he breached the contract by not paying the money before, by doing other business before paying the money. That's the interest. I mean, basically, I think we're in the same place. We conceded the 2.5 million if that's going to make things move faster. So the methodology of calculating interest is something that was already understood, this new methodology of Kenneth's use of the money is not what this court held. This court held Bernice was entitled to the deprivation of her use of the money. The, the appellant's briefs argue that nothing in the settlement agreement made the entire unpaid amount due any earlier than June 1, 2017. 
we would submit that the settlement agreement on its face required the money to be due prior to that date if Kenneth elected to enter into other transactions or fund other transactions, which he did. If the court has no questions, no further questions on that issue, I'd like to turn to the, to the question of the withdrawal date from the LLC. Appellant suggests that his conduct is irrelevant. We would sub and the case the statute law. I understand your, your adversary relies on the statute, but is there a case law that that illuminates this issue as, as as to whether or not we should look at conduct in determining withdrawal date? Well, so what the case law is, and it's it's there's one case that appellant relies on, the Chu case, which in that case, on those facts, the court found that the filing of a motion to assert a counterclaim for withdrawal satisfied the statutory notice requirement. But it did not hold as a matter of law that once you file a claim, then automatically six months later, six months later you've withdrawn. In fact, what you have to look at is the notice that was actually given. And here, the notice that was given by appellant in the amended complaint was a request to dissolve the LLCs. He did seek, in the alternative, withdrawal. And so what he alleged was that if the court declines to proceed with dissolution, in the alternative, Ken is entitled to withdraw. That did not provide notice to Bernice or anyone that appellant was claiming he was withdrawing six months later. In fact, his conduct is entirely inconsistent with that withdrawal, including in November of 2018, nearly two years after he claims he was no longer a member, he moved for summary judgment on his claim for dissolution, which he would not obviously have had standing to do if he were no longer a member. The first time that appellant made any suggestion to anyone that he believed he had withdrawn as of December of 2016, was in 2019 when he realized that the value of, his, of the buildings had declined, likely because of the change in the rent regulations that were then publicized and were soon to be enacted. But for the first time in his reply, he argues that he believes the property values in New York City had decreased by 20%. That's at page 1285, 1289 of the appendix. That is the first time that he suddenly claims, oh, I had withdrawn actually, two years earlier. Because his conduct, as the court pointed out, throughout that period, gave no indication that he intended to withdraw, including his filing of tax returns. And it wasn't only the tax returns. I know Appellant likes to make the argument that he had, it wasn't him, he had to do it, you have to file until it's liquidated. But the designation on those tax returns changed to, to point to Appellant as the tax matter partner and the partnership representative. Meaning he became, in 2017 and 2018, the person to whom the IRS would look for questions or for an audit with respect to these tax returns. And the tax returns, properly so, were extremely compelling to the lower court as to the basis for uh, a finding essentially of estoppel, that he could not claim after the fact that he had withdrawn two years earlier when that claim was entirely inconsistent with his conduct. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. Uh, very briefly, Your Honors, a couple of points. The one thing that uh, my opposing counsel does not discuss is the statute that governs all of this. Okay, the statute says you issue written notice. It was done. Well, what you are, your, I understand the argument to be is that it, it wasn't. Um, uh, good or sufficient written notice because uh, it was done in the alternative. You asked for dissolution, and then if, if not possible, then withdrawal. 
And then you continue uh, managing the properties. Let's take them in order, Judge. The CPLR allows, allows pleading in the alternative. That's an, that's an argument. But the question is whether it's adequate written notice. That's Wouldn't it be fair for them to think that what you're really seeking is dissolution? That ship sailed in 2019 when the judge granted our motion for summary judgment on withdrawal. The only notice we ever gave was in the pleading. We were granted summary judgment on that. There was never any appeal on that. It wasn't raised on the last appeal. It's, that ship has sailed. We got summary judgment on that claim. Uh, so the issue is, did we give written notice? We did. How do I know? I got summary judgment on the claim. All the rest of it is just, frankly, talking, trying to convince you that the statute shouldn't be applied. I don't get why it shouldn't be applied. It says what it says, and all we're asking the court to do is to apply it. There's no answer, certainly you didn't hear one, uh, from opposing counsel as to why all of that stuff that's relevant in dissolution should be, in, should be imported into a statute that doesn't make any of it relevant for withdrawal. That's the bottom line here. In terms of the, of the damages, again, what this court said last go around is they get use of the money damages. What the trial court answered was what money were they deprived of the use of? And the only money they were deprived of the use of up until April of 2017 when Ken paid the last bit of the 14 million was the cash he used to buy these properties. That was the only money that he had to pay them. It, it, it follows because they have to prove that the breach caused harm. And the only harm they could have had was money that could have been used by him to pay down the settlement. That was the cash, it, and that's exactly how the trial court read your decision. I think she was absolutely correct. Unless the court has any further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just briefly, Your Honors. Uh, the harm that was, first of all, causation obviously is an element of the breach of contract claim, which appellant didn't appeal and, and can no longer challenge. Um, but in any event, it is clear that the agreement which required him to pay $14 million before entering into any other transactions, that, he, that the, it was, the damage was caused by his failure to repay that $14 million, which she expected once he entered into transactions. Counsel um, said that I did not uh, refer to the statute. So if I were to quote the statute, it says that a member may withdraw upon not less than six months prior written notice to the LLC upon not less than six months notice, so we submit that the notice that was given was that appellant intended to withdraw if the court denied dissolution, which is exactly what was pled. Thank you, Your Honors. We ask that you modify the, uh, the decision and the judgment with respect to the amount of damage and otherwise affirm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. 800 Third Avenue versus Roadrunner Capital. Good afternoon, Your Honors, and may it please the court. Uh, James M. Hirshhorn for uh, Defendant uh, Appellant Roadrunner Capital. I'd uh, like to begin by conceding that the law leaves my client a very narrow window to get the result it wants. Uh, I'm representing a commercial tenant under a standard form lease uh, who is claiming the benefit of an oral agreement to reduce uh, its rent by 50%. Not exactly unequivocal evidence of payment on this record. Well, Your Honor, uh, what this court's uh, opinion in Paramount uh, held was that a uh, tenant in that situation could not come in and simply make, I believe the exact quote from Paramount is a bald assertion of an oral agreement. There has to be some corroboration. Paramount, well, it's there was a little more than that. It's, it has to be unequivocally referable, right? That's the language uh, from you, Joy. And the reason why it's unequivocally referable in this case is because unlike Paramount, 
unlike uh, the Joseph Day case that was cited in Ujoy, unlike uh, 99 Realty, which uh, landlord cites, uh, the landlord in this case wanted something from my client more than performance under the unmodified lease. The agreement was made, the negotiations took place at the height of the pandemic. I, I understand all the reasons that this could be, but back to the unequivocally referable to the oral modification and evidence of that. From what I understand, from what I see from the record, you two sophisticated parties, each had access to counsel. There are a myriad of ways that one can protect oneself, but there's, the question is where in this record, where there's this oral, claimed oral modification, and you know, the bases that are claimed for why it, it was, this agreement was made, where is that unequivocal evidence? The answer, Your Honor, is that uh, it's undisputed that there were negotiations for the renewal of the lease. This is something that the landlord wanted that the tenant was not obliged to provide under the existing lease. At the height of the pandemic, uh, there was tremendous uncertainty as to whether or not, uh, not whether or not, let me rephrase that, tremendous uncertainty as to what the commercial real estate market uh, what's going to look like uh, in the aftermath of when the pandemic restrictions ended, if they ever would. Uh, landlord had very strong reasons to want to obtain the tenants' the consent to an extension. And the agreement to reduce rent in order to bring about uh, goodwill was rational in that circumstance. It's corroborated by the landlord's course of conduct. Uh, after the agreement was made. Not only do we not have any kind of documentary objection to the half rent for three months after the tenant began to pay it. But there uh, could be, I mean, couldn't it simply be, be that your client couldn't afford to pay it, that he was having difficulty, and that's why, and not that this was directly related to this 50% no, 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 Your Honor, I disagree. I mean, uh, Tenants often ask for what you might call a Ritter Rachmanis, but landlords have no obligation to give one. If all that were involved here were the four corners of the lease, the landlord uh, didn't have any motive. Renewal gave it a motive, and that's corroborated by the landlord's course of conduct afterwards. It's undisputed that, as Mr. Schottenfeld uh, says on page 118 of the record, that the landlord didn't assert the claim for full rent until after the negotiations for renewal broke off. I'd add to that that the landlord's explanation in its uh, brief as to why not is not only not in the record below, but is false in fact. The landlord asserts that it could not have sued because uh, Executive Order 202.8 has extended uh, prohibited suits uh, for eviction. This is not a suit for eviction. Landlord never sued for eviction. It's simply a suit for unpaid rent for a declaration that unpaid rent uh, that is due in the remaining term of the lease is due. And for that reason, Your Honor, I would argue that we were entitled under Cam versus Minor to pursue discovery as to whether or not in the landlord's files, because an organization like Joseph Day is likely to have had detailed records of the lease negotiations. Well, but would, wouldn't you have those same uh, records of lease negotiations? No, we wouldn't have the same records, Your Honor, because of course we're the tenant looking for mercy. What's in our records would Isn't there not an be email? Isn't there a letter? Isn't there a something that went from the landlord to your client or from your client? to the landlord suggesting that uh, uh, the rent be negotiated, that the lease be negotiated? No, Your Honor, there's no correspondence either way. What we're seeking in discovery is very narrowly targeted. It's whether there's any contemporaneous notes by the landlord that recognizes that this agreement was made. Thank you. You have no further questions? Thank you. 
Hey, please, the court. Jeffrey Clarsfeld, Jeffrey Clarsfeld for the landlord in this case. Your Honor, you hit it on the nose. There is not one document in this case. There's not an email. There's not a letter. There's absolutely nothing requesting a rent waiver or modification. There's nothing confirming it. There's nothing discussing it. Not one email. These are sophisticated parties. The rent here is over $100,000 a month. Counsel, I know that um, your adversary indicates about the landlord's uh, course of conduct, you know, the acceptance of the partial payment. But uh, I believe it was um, paragraph 25 and I think right of 45 that indicated that the acceptance of partial payments would not preclude the landlord from still seeking the balance of whatever was owed, right? That's correct, Your Honor. There's, there's three paragraphs of the lease that I cite. It's codified by the general obligation law that clearly says partial payments are without prejudice to the landlord to collect the full amount. Uh, so you have it in the lease, you have it codified in the general obligation law, you have the case law that has a very, very, very narrow exception for conduct that's partial performance that's unequivocally referable to the agreement. Here you have nothing. You have a three month. What about, what about your adversary saying that that was essentially consideration for uh, ext a lease extension? The lease was never extended. There was no extension. Well, but there, was, there were presumably discussions. I mean, that's, that's the point they're making, right? There, there, there may have been discussions, but a partial, a partial payment of rent this court has held is just as indicative of a partial payment of rent as it is an agreement to reduce the rent. Three months, three months of partial payments, the landlord served the rent demand. Three months later, the landlord commenced this action. That's not a delay. The landlord never sat on his rights collecting half rent and then turns around years later and says, okay, we want all the rent back. He acted pretty quickly, six months into COVID. Three months, he served the rent demand. Three months later, he filed this case. There's no delay here. There's no documents. There's nothing unequivocally referable. This case, Your Honor, is nothing more than, and counsel's attempt to seek my client's internal documents, not correspondence, internal documents that my client made, made have made notes indicating that there was an agreement is by, that is the quintessential fishing expedition that's barred by 3212F. I, I contend based on that the lower court properly rejected those claims and granted my client summary judgment. Thank you. If your honors have no further questions. Thank you. Very briefly, your honor, of course the lease contains those no waiver and no partial payment provisions. Uh, the issue in this case is whether there's uh, sufficient corroborating evidence that those uh, provisions were waived by the oral discussion. Uh, it is correct that the lease was ultimately not extended, and uh, it is also correct that uh, it was only when the negotiations broke off, which uh, landlord doesn't dispute, that they moved to, to demand rent and then to sue us. And finally, as to this being a fishing expedition, we'll stand on the cases in our brief that we are not simply hoping, like Mr. McAuber, that something will turn up we have targeted information, uh, very narrowly targeted, and that's what we're seeking. If there are no other cases, no other questions, rather, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you both. Apotex Corp. versus Hespira Healthcare. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Uh, David Goroff for Appellant Apotex Corp. Your Honors, there are two bedrock principles that apply when a federal district court loses subject matter jurisdiction. First, a federal court without such jurisdiction can only dismiss a claim with prejudice. It cannot dismiss, without prejudice, excuse me, it cannot dismiss with prejudice or rule on the merits. Second, a dismissal without prejudice is never a decision on the merits and cannot have race judicata effect. What about collateral estoppel? Do you want to address collateral estoppel? Let's put aside race judicata. Sure. Collater collateral estoppel, um, Hasbira Inc., who we're talking about, was not 
a contract party for the years 2010 to 2017. It was simply a competitor. And the contract was set up, as, as the facts in the complaint show, uh, because Apotex didn't want a competitor having control over its supply. So Hospira India was set up as the contract party. And ultimately, there was a determination by Judge Furman in the Southern District that the claims of, against Hospira India duplicated, the tort claims, duplicated those of contract under the independent tort doctrine. And that is a unique personal defense for the years 2010 to 2017 to Hospira India. We cite uh, the Schroen versus Grunstein case, we cite pages of cases actually, that, that hold that the independent tort doctrine, which depends on a contract, can never apply for the benefit of a non-contract party. So that precludes the issues of identity, the elements I should say of identity, and of um, privity for purposes of collateral estoppel for the years 2010 to 2017, because there's no question that Hospira Inc., what, which I'll sometimes call Inc., was not a contract party. And indeed, I believe, if I read pages 37 and 43 right in uh, Hospira's brief, they concede that that collateral estoppel should not apply except for the years 2017 and after. And we have a, a reason why it shouldn't apply as to those years as well, and that's that the independent tort doctrine is not, a, is not an automatic, if there's a contract, there's no tort claim doctrine. It's one that requires a higher bar. It requires an independent duty. And the independent duty that was found in cases such as Albert Marley um, is one where there is a, a duty not to willfully harm someone, a, a, a duty where what you've done to someone goes beyond anything that would be for your own competitive advantage. And we see that with Hospira Inc. in 2019, because in 2019, Hospira Inc. controlled the plant where the products for Apotex were exclusively made, and there were certain of these products that Apotex could get nowhere else. And Hospira simply closed the plant. It closed the plant without making any arrangements to get alternative supply from anyone else for Apotex. And that had the effect of ejecting Apotex from the market, even to this day, for certain of the most valuable products that were part of that portfolio. So uh, the, the question I have is, is with respect to uh, this, this doctrine, uh, what, do, what does our, our case law say about it? Doesn't it require some kind of special relationship, i.e. fiduciary relationship, for example? What is the relationship that we would use to impose the doctrine. For collateral uh, estoppel? No, no, I'm talking about the independent tort. Oh, the, the independent tort requires some kind of independent duty. So in, in cases like uh, there's the Rich case from last century, Albert Marley is really our best case where basically a competitor took hold of a theater chain and drove its competitor out. And we're, we, we have an analogy here where the competitor, Inc., took over the means of production, the IKKT plant in India, and, and literally shut it down, but used it to, to disadvantage its rival. So the duty is one that's been recognized in Albert Marley in a case called Carvel in Rich and others, not to willfully injure somebody. So it's a, it's a heightened kind of injury. So that's the independent duty here. So uh, if I... If I've answered the collateral estoppel questions, let me go back to race judicata if I, if I can. So the principles of, of race judicata uh, that I talked about, what it means to have a dismissal without prejudice, um, apply to both asserted claims, which there's no real dispute, but also to unasserted. And we see that in two cases. We see it first in the Mimo Lenoy case, which we, we cite. And, and, and the substance of that fact is not disputed by Hospira. They just say, well, that involved pro se plaintiffs, which I'll get to. But in Mimo, Illinois, you had a couple whose family relationship was treated unequally at a time of an emergency by a hospital system in Wisconsin. And so they um, sued. And they originally brought claims only under federal law, under Title II initially of, of the federal uh, statute, and, and then later when that failed under Medicare. They could have raised Wisconsin state sexual orientation discrimination claims as well, but they didn't. Nonetheless, when the judge dismissed the federal claims, she made an observation that perhaps this would state a Wisconsin claim, it doesn't state a federal claim as the, as the statutes were then written. And so they bring a new case. 
Again, what they could have, so if, if the could have test would have been applied, they couldn't have done that. But in fact, Judge Adelson, in, Lynn Adelman rather, in the, in the Eastern District of Wisconsin holds that the state claims, the dismissal of federal claims was without prejudice to the right to, lead, to re replead state claims. And so that's what they did. We, if, for, in other words, you're saying that the way that it's written here in the federal court, in the Southern District, the decision, wasn't, um, wasn't all-inclusive. In other words, the fact that it said you can't bring these claims doesn't mean that you couldn't bring other, otherwise bring claims. That, that that's were. right. And, and to be candid, Your Honor, it doesn't so much matter what Judge Furman said, but Judge Furman basically said, you know, I'm dismissing the federal claims, and those are brought under federal question jurisdiction and antitrust 1337 jurisdiction, and I'm going to consider what I do with the rest. And he observes in his 2020 decision that, you know, the law tells me that if we are at the pleading stage, um, we dismiss without prejudice, and, and we don't exercise supplemental jurisdiction. And he also says that there are cases that actually uh, say that, that that is better for interests such as judicial economy, fairness. It's also a strong federalism principle, which is noted in the Hernandez case that uh, we cite in our briefs. And so all of those factors then lead him not to exercise uh, supplemental jurisdiction. Well, the only way you have jurisdiction over the state tort claims is if he does. So when he doesn't, anything you could have said, you did say under state law, as the Mimo Illinois case shows, is out. And you see the same thing also in the Semtec decision by the US Supreme Court. And we know that's not a pro se case because it involves Lockheed, uh, a Fortune, I think, 100 corporation. But there, the, uh, the plaintiff sued in California for contract and, and tort claims only under California law in federal court could have raised claims under other states' laws, was certainly allowed to, didn't. And the California claims were found to be barred by the statute of limitations. The US Supreme, so they file a new case under Maryland law saying, hey, same thing violates Maryland law, let us sue here. Maryland courts say, no, race judicata. California bars this. The Supreme Court says, no, doesn't bar this because California was a statute of limitations decision that's essentially not a decision on the merits. And therefore, the merits still re can be decided elsewhere. And so they let them, they reverse the Maryland court and they say, no, they can, they can assert these claims there. So, and the only case they have, they put so much powder in this FTE case and they mischaracterize it. The FTE case is one where Judge George Daniels in the Southern District dis heard state cases, state claims I should say, for fraud and unjust enrichment decided those, he dismissed them, 425 F SUP, four, uh, second 458. Not only did he consider them, the Second Circuit considered it. <laughs> and in 2010 issued what uh, is called the FTE um, summary opinion. And that's 400 F second 611, and they affirm. And then those have been considered as supplemental claims, and they've been rejected. So it's your classic collateral estoppel claim. They come and tell the court, and I see my time is up, but if I may just finish the sentence. They tell the court that uh, there was no exercise of supplemental jurisdiction. That's flat wrong. If you look at page 745, 809 F second 745, and they tell the court that it wasn't adjudicated. It, it was, the very page they cite, it was. Thank you, Your Honors. Good afternoon, and may it please the court, Amy Saharia for Respondent Hospira, Inc. I'd like to start where we left off with race judicata because I think that provides the most straightforward path for the court to affirm. And uh, let me focus on, the, uh, on Hospira, Inc. and the final judgment on the merits with respect to Hospira, Inc. What was the basis for the dismissal of the, uh, the state claims? The basis for the dismissal of the state claims as to Hospira, Inc was the court's uh, decision not to exercise supplemental okay, so jurisdiction. Wouldn't it be fair then to say that essentially it was a jurisdictional uh, dismissal on jurisdictional grounds, which would be without prejudice? As to the two state claims that were remaining, that is correct, but there was also a dismissal on the merits as to the federal antitrust claim. 
And uh, that was a final judgment on the merits. The January 2020 order dismissed the federal antitrust claim against Hospira Inc. on the merits. That became final in February 2020 when the case was over. And the consequence of that judgment on the merits as to the federal antitrust claim is that Apotex is barred under race judicata from bringing claims that it could have asserted together with that federal antitrust claim that arose from the same series of uh, events and transactions. And we all agree these claims arise from the very same series of events you and know, transactions. You know, I really am having trouble following the argument. Uh, if, in fact, the court declined to exercise supplemental jurisdiction, which is its right, uh, why shouldn't state court, why shouldn't the plaintiff then be able to plead those claims in state court? I'm talking about the unpled claims. Well, I would point the court to the Second Circuit's decision in FTE, which we did not mischaracterize and which is right on point, and it is binding case law. Um, this is a federal judgment, so this court is bound by federal law. And in that case, admittedly, it's a very complex case, but um, at one stage of the proceedings, there was a dismissal on the merits of certain claims. They happen to be state law claims, but that doesn't matter. There was a dismissal on the merits as to some claims but not all of them. So the case proceeds, and the ultimate resolution of the case at its end, the first case, was that the federal court dismissed some claims for lack of standing, the federal claims, and then said, I'm not going to exercise supplemental jurisdiction over the remaining state law claims. That's the first action. The plaintiff then brings a second action, and in that second action, they attempt to bring new state law claims. And the federal court said, that is barred. Those, are, those state law claims that were remaining at the end of the first action, those could be repleted because you had brought them and they were dismissed without prejudice. But because there was an adjudication on the merits in that first action, even though it occurred at an earlier stage of the proceedings, any other state law claims that you could have brought and didn't were barred. And that's exactly what we have here. We have a final judgment on the merits as to Hospira Inc., we have two claims that Apotex chose to bring that were dismissed without prejudice. Those two claims can proceed. They are, they're proceeding below. But any other state law claims that it could have brought, and it could have brought these claims, are now barred by race judicata. Now, let me turn to the, the, the point about supplemental jurisdiction. Supplemental jurisdiction is jurisdiction. The federal court had jurisdiction over these claims if they had been brought. Now, supplemental jurisdiction is discretionary jurisdiction. That's why cases like Brown from the Ninth Circuit, that's why cases like the Gillies case from the DC Court of Appeals require parties coming to federal court to bring all of their state law claims at that time to ask the federal court to exercise supplemental jurisdiction over those claims. And if they fail to do so, they are barred in the second action because you have to give the federal court that opportunity to exercise jurisdiction. Can you, can you address collateral estoppel, please? Yes, so uh, uh, my colleague on the other side is correct that our collateral estoppel claim is more limited than race judicata because it only applies to the claims insofar as they're based on conduct from 2017 forward. Uh, certain of the claims are based only on such conduct. Some of them span pre-2017 and post-2017 allegations. But as to collateral estoppel, the issue here is whether this contract and a claim for breach of this contract um, duplicates the, uh, the quasi-contract claims and whether the independent tort doctrine bars uh, tort claims because of the existence of this contract. That is the same issue that was uh, litigated and decided in the federal action. It is the same issue that is at issue here. Now, the only thing that I, that I think I've heard from the other side is that perhaps the, uh, the Albemarle case could provide some argument that, uh, that based on certain allegations in this case against Hospira Inc., that the analysis under the independent tort doctrine might be different. But the only thing they can point to uh, that is a, a new allegation with respect to Hospira Inc., it's not even a new allegation, it was an allegation in the prior case, but the only thing they point to with respect to Hospira Inc. is the fact that uh, Hospira Inc. closed the IKKT plant 
um, in 2019, but there's no allegation anywhere in this complaint that that was done willfully or maliciously with the intent to harm Apotex, which is that's what's required under Albemarle. The allegations in the complaint, and I'd point the court to paragraph 346, make clear that that closure occurred in the wake of an FDA audit of that plant. Um, there's just no allegation that could make the collateral estoppel inquiry uh, before the court now isn't any there, Isn't there a claim here that actually um, your client um, made certain misrepresentations to the FDA with respect to the plant, which was the cause of the closing? And would that be harmful conduct to a competitor? I, I don't, so yes and no. Yes, there are allegations that the reasons for that FDA audit or the findings of that FDA audit related to certain, I think, data um, misrepresentations. I'm not sure they were made to the FDA as opposed to the FDA found those data problems when it conducted the audit, but there's no allegation that that data issue somehow was uh, intentionally directed towards Apotex in any way. And I don't think that particular issue somehow could change um, the nature of the issue in this case as compared to the federal case such a collateral estoppel would not apply. Now again, uh, we urge the court to affirm on race judicata grounds in the first instance, collateral estoppel grounds um, only as an alternative. And again, with respect to race judicata, I would just highlight the fact that um, there's a lot of talk about privity in the briefs between Hospira Inc. and Hospira India, but the court doesn't need to reach that question because Hospira Inc. was a party to the prior proceedings. Uh, there was a final judgment on the merits um, as to Hospira Inc. These claims could have been brought, they should have been brought. In fact, um, Apotex proposed to bring them in its proposed second amended complaint. And then when it saw that it didn't like how the federal proceedings were going, it tried to put those claims in its pocket and try again in state court, and raised judicata prohibits that action. We urge the court to affirm. Thank you. So my, my colleague made an important admission there that when it comes to collateral estoppel, they agree it doesn't protect claims against Hespera Inc. from 2010 to 2017. So then we're just left with, does lying to the FDA, whether by concealment or overt misrepresentation, count as a, a willful misconduct when it's coupled with closing the plant? I mean, unlike Hespera India, which just but had... I, I think you had, what your adversary also argues is that there's really nothing um, in your complaint that would support um, a, uh, a that allegation. Mm -hmm. Support the closing of the plant? Well, no. Intentional. No. I think that, that oh, the idea yes, that there's misconduct. intentional. I, I'm sorry, Your Honor. I believe, I, I, I'm sorry if I stepped on your question. No. I, I believe there is. So we, tell me what because, is And what, what's there is they had, we asked them to give us alternative product. They had two ways of doing it. They could contract with a third party manufacturer, actually three. They could make the product at another of the many plants that Pfizer has across the world. Or, or three, they could take with Pfizer's own product and they could sell it to us as what's called an authorized generic. They did nothing. They left us cold and, cold and empty and out of the market while they continued to sell the products, and these are some of the most profitable in the generic injectable industry. So then we looked to race judicata. I did not hear Hospira's counsel address Semtech or MIMO or, or the principles I made. What I heard is a doubling down on FTE, so let's just look at FTE. At page 741 of the opinion, they go through that... Um, the district court dismissed Lanham Act claims, quote, on the ground that the marks have been incontestable, as well as the state law claims of fraud and unjust enrichment. That, that's not, you know, not exercising supplemental jurisdiction and not deciding something. And, and so since there appears to be some confusion as to what the race judicata ruling there was, was of, let me just point the court to page 745, which they cite, and it says, FTE's unfair competition claims and federal trademark claims were previously brought and abandoned, while FTE state law trademark infringement and dilution claims could have been brought but were not. Because our opinion in FTE 2 summary order affirming the district court's dismissal of FTE's prior litigation constituted an adjudication on the merits, I'm missing a, skipping a quote here, all of FTE's non-section 32-1 claims, i.e. common law claims, are barred. They're barred because of what Judge Daniels did in 2006, not all the rest of the stuff 
uh, that council talked about just there. Thank you very much, Your Honors. Thank you. Thank you both. Jewish Press versus Kingsborough Community College. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the Court. Samuel Spurgel on behalf of appellant, petitioner, the Jewish press. Your Honors, this appeal arises from the wrongful denial below of petitioner's motion sequence number four, which sought attorney's fees pursuant to public officer's law 89.4.C.2, mandatory fee shifting provision. Inasmuch as respondents produced to the appellant documents which were never previously produced by email dated June 14th, 2021. That constituted a new production under the public officers. Even if the, these are the uh, documents with the law department, correct? These were the documents that the law. So even if these documents were obtained, as I understand from the record, uh, through a, a um, uh, FOIL request, correct? By yes, correct. the law department. So, so What's your argument, that they're being held for the benefit of? Uh, those, those documents that were produced in June of 2021 were unreasonably withheld and were held by the New York City Law Department as counsel for Kingsborough and CUNY, and they were held by Law Department for their benefit. Well, how? But that's not renewal. I mean, I'm sorry. That, that doesn't go to Kingsborough. I mean, you, you're, you did a renewal motion. That's not new evidence with regard to Kingsborough. That's evidence with regard to the law department. The motion was against Kingsborough. You're correct, Your Honor. The motion, well, I'd like to just point out one clarification. The request in the underlying motion for attorney's fees uh, was a first, it was not a renewal. That was the first application for fees pursuant to or following the respondent's production of those new documents. So this is a first application for attorney's fees and Jewish Press appellant is the um, prevailing party based upon that new production. With regard Counsel, to the courts- I'd like to go back if I may because uh, Kingsborough Community College, uh, that party was the subject of the 2019 fall requests. So how do you establish that the law department's possession of the lax complaint in 2015 and 2017, you know, falls to um, the college. I, I don't see it. Simply, Your Honor, and I direct the court's attention to the record of pages 40 through 43, with specifically the Carter Declaration. And what I'm referring to, Your Honors, is those documents that the respondents and respondents' counsel ultimately produced in June of 2021 were held by and submitted by Mr. Carter in his declaration in defense and support of a federal action naming Kingsborough Community College and CUNY as defendants in a federal action. It was handled by New York City Law Department. That declaration attests to, attested to by Mr. Carter state specifically that those documents that are listed in those pages at the record are documents that are regularly maintained by defendant Kingsborough Community College. So that's how the connection is made that respondent Kingsborough was provided with those documents and, Your Honor, citing or re referring, excuse me, to the matter of Encore College bookstores, states and the Committee on Open Government, and I'm quoting from the appellant's brief, uh, excuse me, appellant's reply brief, page six. Committee on Open Government, which states that documents need not be in the physical possession of an agency to constitute agency records, so long as they are produced, kept, or filed for an agency. The courts have held that they constitute, quote, agency records, even if they are maintained apart from agencies' premises. So in this case, Your Honors, 
Those documents that the New York City Law Department filed in the lax federal action are attested to by counsel that these documents are maintained by his client and they were submitted to a court on behalf of his client. Now, I'd like to call the court's attention because in addition to the matter that's on the docket, there's also a motion that's before your honors as well. And appellants are seeking in that motion for the court to take judicial notice of documents, namely the EEOC FOIA request that was submitted by the New York City Law Department on behalf of its client. Now, those documents go back to, they were produced and so in terms of addressing any consideration the court may have, they were produced by the New York City Law Department in response to appellant's request at the time and after the reply, the respondent's re brief was submitted. That's why they were not obtained earlier. And there's a authenticity to them because they were produced both by the Law Department to appellant in response to a FOIA and initially by the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission to the New York City Law Department's initial request. And it's important, Your Honors, because the first FOIA request on behalf of respondents was made in February of 2016. A follow-up second request was made in June of 2016. And a notice of right to sue was sent by the EEOC to Kingsborough Community College on November 30th, 2015. If I may just finish the thought, Your Honors. Yes. What that demonstrates conclusively for this court is that respondents were in possession of documents responsive to the underlying FOIL request at the time the underlying FOIL was requested in April of 2019. That means this entire protracted litigation could have been avoided with regard to these documents, which are clearly enumerated in that FOIL, had they provided the documents that respondent and its attorneys have been in possession with since at least the date of the Corbin Declaration, which is December 20, 2017. Again, two years before the underlying FOIL request. If ever there was a case where the fee shifting provision and the mandatory fees should be applied, it's this particular case with these documents. I reserve and thank you for the allowing me to go over. Of course. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Julie Steiner for the respondents. Counsel, I'd like you to start where counsel ended. Um, in that, you know, how does it happen that the K, the, the college gets this this FOIL request, and the law department doesn't respond to it? I mean, why did it take two years essentially for the law to? The so. The first part of that is that the FOIA request was submitted directly to KCC. Yes. And twice, KCC conducted diligent searches. And it, the, the certification for the first search was um, a, by the, for one of the, again, the, let me start back. This is like the third time that this issue is before the Supreme Court. And the first time, the certification from KCC was found to be um, sufficient. The second time, the attorney's affirmation attesting to the diligent search by KCC was also found to be sufficient. So twice KCC searched numerous documents um, in its facility, including going to the attorney um, that handles the EEOC complaints and found nothing. Now the law, as to the, so there is no bad faith on the part of KCC in indicating that it searched for the lax complaint and did not but find it. That's true, but if I just get, my, my question is, the law department is there as yes. a representative. Why wouldn't anybody say, we've gotten this FOIL request for, do you have it? I mean, after the first time, okay, maybe the first time they searched their own records. Now it's twice and no one says, law department, they're, they're seeking these records, do you have them? I mean, so why the protracted litigation for something like this? I understand the, the, the concern of this court, but there, none of the cases that the plaintiff cites suggest that Casey's, excuse me, let me try, backtrack. There was nothing in the record that suggests the KCC was aware that the law department, A, made the FOIA but request. That's not, I think that's not the issue. The, the issue is, is um, well, first, you, do you agree with counsel that 
another entity can hold agency records. It doesn't have to be KCC. That, that's black letter law, correct? That is correct. Okay, However, so in this instance, isn't there an argument to be made under the Encore College Bookstore case that, uh, that the records that were subject to the FOIL were held by the law department for the benefit of KCC? So the Encore case is not in the attorney-client context. Uh, plaintiffs does not cite any case regarding the holding for in the context of an attorney-client situation. That, should that make a difference? Excuse me? Should that make a difference? I think in this case... I it think that's what you were trying to ask yes. previously, if you could finish. I think there... I researched, I searched. There, I don't find a single case that suggests that the, that the attorney for the agency to whom the FOIA request was sent is obligated willy-nilly to, to the, if it's not, for A, if it's not um, informed of the FOIL request, and number two, is required to turn over anything that is being held in the course of a separate federal litigation under the attorney-client privilege. I, we have found no case that, 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 that supports that proposition. Um, I would like to make one comment, Your Honor. He is uh, right now arguing his motion that he has before the court that was returnable yesterday. And since he is now discussing that, I'd like to make out, um, to, to point out that he's seeking to make, ask his court for judicial notice of certain records. His judicial notice argument does not hold any water given that A, the records that he is asking this court to take judicial notice of are an attempt to reverse the order of the Supreme Court, which is not allowed under the judicial notice law. Number two, number two, more particularly, the record does not, does not do anything that already isn't in the record. The record shows that we said in 2021, meaning we, the law department, we found the last complaint through a FOIA request. Here it is. It does not suggest any bad faith. It does not suggest that KCC knew that the law department had it, that the KCC acted um, in a nefarious manner by not turning this document. It does not prove anything that he is, tr it's not incontrovertible, incontro which you will see in our papers when you read the motion papers, is necessary for judicial notice. So nothing in this record suggests that KCC um, knew that the law department had it, that KCC had it itself, that the law department was required to turn it over when it was not the, the, the party to whom the FOIL request was made. And so these records that he's now trying to put um, through to this court through um, a separate motion should not be given judicial notice. And based upon the record before this court, the Supreme Court properly denied them their second renewal motion attempting to seek attorney's fees. Thank, Thank you. you, Your Honor. Excuse me. Uh, Your Honors, my adversary is attempting to convey to this court that the FOIL documents to which they exchanged in June of 2021 were first received by the Law Department on behalf of the respondent, Kingsborough, in 2021. Even if this court does not consider the motion and does not take judicial notice of the timing of when the underlying FOIL was made, that underlying FOIL without argument is conceded that it was prior to 2021. In fact, if we use what's before us in the record, and specifically the Carter Declaration at pages 40, that was in December of, I'm sorry, I just want to get the date. That was December of 2017, Your Honors. So at least four years before they, in a spirit of cooperation, and I'm quoting from the email at record, page 37, in the interest of cooperation, the Corporation Counsel's Office decided to exchange documents that were subject to the underlying FOIL at the time it was made. That's not in the spirit or well, interest so I, of cooperation. So I, I, That's under an obligation from the court once the action was commenced. Counsel, uh, your adversary uh, distinguishes uh, the Encore College case uh, saying that there's an attorney-client uh, relationship here. Does that make a difference? No, Your Honor, it doesn't make a difference. So in other words, so in other words, the law department would would turn over all kinds of privileged material, or what? I mean, how would this work in the future? 
Okay, so obviously privileged material, there would be a separate application in the event that privileged material was sought, and I guess they would need to seek an exemption, something which was never made or applied for in this particular case. But in tellingly, Your Honor, in the Carter Declaration, again at record at page 40, he submitted these documents to a public court. He put them on the PACER system. So the notion that in this particular case, they're exempt Again, not under FOIL, but th their obligation to disclose this information is relieved and they don't have that burden is inapt specifically because the documents sought by the underlying FOIL of April 2019 were previously produced and put on PACER in defense of the exact same case in December of 2017 two years before the FOIL was made. The notion that they can exempt themselves because they didn't possess it is, is ridiculous, and if I may just call the court's attention to paragraphs two and three of the Carter Declaration at page 40, this declaration is based on personal knowledge as well as the books and records maintained by the City University of New York, Kingsborough Community College, and the Law Department of the City of New York. That's paragraph two. Paragraph three, annexed here too as exhibits A to AA, are documents made and kept in the ordinary course of defendants business, and it was a regular practice of defendants to make or keep these records. So simply, the notion that they produced a certification in connection with this underlying case is clearly controverted by their own attorney's production of documents from the same agency. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. Thank you, Officer. Have a good evening. Mm-hmm. 